Let's get started. We're looking at lab 10, bird's eye view. Here, we're going to look at primes.py, our first program or module is the official name for a program file in Python. And it's important that the, its name ends with a .py. One reason why is so that we have this beautiful color coding in any Python aware environment. So you want to be sure you have a good environment that shows you colors. They give you hints about what you're doing. Now then, our primes.py, like all programs that you're going to see from me, because they were developed on Macs, I must have this first line, the pound exclamation point line that makes this program, user bin env, start up, and it then reads the next word, Python 3, and it runs the rest of the file in Python 3. If I'm on Windows, I don't need to do that. It's quite likely you don't need that three. I only need that three because I have both Python 2 and Python 3. You'll see that this line starts with a pound sign. That means it's a comment to the interpreter, not to the operating system. It made it behave. And then we'll see that all these other things that start with pound signs and are bright red, those are comments and will be ignored by the interpreter. This line two is also the start of a comment. This particular comment in green with a quote, 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 this is a doc string for the module is what it's called. It's a very important string and we won't understand why it's so important for a little bit we will soon see that it is important. It comes to our callers, to our consumers, the other programmers who use our code as help. So it's important to have this be good documentation for your module. When you have a triple quote string like this, that particular string does not end into the mat until we get to the matching triple quotes. So inside this one string here, we have new line characters that we can't see. We also have quotes inside the quotes and nothing confuses the interpreter when it's inside the triple quotes. Very handy. Now usually when you have triple quotes or any kind of a string, you're going to assign it to an identifier or maybe you're going to print it, but this is an odd one that it just sits there and that makes it a comment. Okay, moving down to line seven. Oh, I should mention that that seven, as well as all those numbers, are my display system. They have nothing to do with Python. Similarly, at the top is also the module name. And the box is produced by my display system. Okay, so max equals 100. That particular particular line deserves some thought because we have in it the assignment operator, which is the biggest workhorse of any compiler or interpreter. It's the big thing. It is what changes what's up there in memory. So what, it, what happens when you have Python is that the interpreter starts on the right-hand side and it evaluates the right-hand side before it even looks at the left-hand side. Here it sees, well, that's a whole number or an integer. So it makes an integer object in memory. And an integer object knows how to plus and minus and modulo and print itself. Everything that an integer might want to do is all that intelligence is inside that object. And then that 100 datum is inside that object too. And that's our 100 integer. When the interpreter is satisfied that it's got everything it can on the right side, then it moves over to the left side. It sees this word, and that is a word we make up. It's an identifier. That's the best name for the word. Now, I know you're going to be thinking variable, 
but it is much more variable than a variable. And in the long run, it helps you to really use the correct word so that you understand better the underlying model that is Python. So this word goes upon that 100 int just as if it was a post-it or a tag of some sort. The identifier, it identifies that object. Moving down to line nine, print. Look at that, it's purple. Everything purple is a built-in. Everything kind of gold orange there, that's a keyword. So Python is made of built-ins and keywords, and then anything else that you invent. But this print is very important to you. It is a function. So we're going to call it with parens, just like any language. And here are arguments. The string with the regular quotes, max, and r, another string with comma separation. These come out on standard out. Let's look at that. Here we're running it. Primes less than. That comes out. And that comma, which separates the objects, produces the space. So max becomes 100, r colon comes out. All with these lovely little spaces. Okay, that's our first print. Now then, let's take the bird's eye view where we look from a distance and we see that everything is so neatly indented. The interpreter insists on that. You can't get through the interpreter without doing careful indentation. Any of the keywords that require a code block like for, which is a loop mechanism, while, which is a loop mechanism, if, else, that statement always ends in a colon, which means here comes a code block. Then automatically in your editor, should happen this indentation. Now you can mess it up if you like, but what is given to you is a good idea to take, then you don't make any mistakes. You'll see that mine gives me four spaces and I think that's the most usual. I don't like fewer and I don't like more. Four is very nice. So in this loop, well, let's look just a little bit at this for loop. We will be looking at it very carefully we see that there is another built-in function call here. And what range combined with in are going to give us, it's going to give us the three, which will be assigned to that number. Number being the identifier we invented. Then it's going to add two and give us five and go around the loop. Add two, give us seven and go around the loop it will never get as big as max, or 100. So 99 will be our last number. Okay, here's our loop, body. It does not end till the unindentation. Nested within that loop, we see another loop, a while loop. There are only two looping mechanisms in Python, for and while. So here's while, like any while. As long as this is true, we're gonna do it again. As long as it's true, we do it again. If this is false, we go into the else. Else is quite overloaded in Python. While, you can think of a while as a continuing looping if. If it's true, we do the loop. If it's false, we go in the else and we're done. Now then, your habit, when you see an else, is to look backwards to the last if and figure that this else means that if this is false, go in there, but not in Python. Indentation is everything in Python. So when you see the else, you go straight up to see what's up there. This else is part of the while mechanism. When this becomes false, it goes in the else. The other way out of this loop is to break. If this becomes true, we're going to break. Break goes out of the whole big looping mechanism, the while and the else goes down to here. 
and then it goes around the four again. So there are two ways out of that while loop, like in all languages. You can break out, which does a big thing, goes beyond the else, or the condition can become false and you go in the else. Now in your old language, you had to set a flag to know which way you got out of your loop. Not here. This is a little strange at first to have an overloaded else, but boy, it is useful. You're going to like it. Makes readable, easy to write code. You're going to like it. Okay, so we're going through a bunch of numbers here as long as they're less than the number that came in on the for loop. We keep multiplying them up. If we find that that div, which we keep doing plus equals one, two, divides evenly into our number, we break out, break, go down there, and we go around, collect the next number, and do it again. But if the div square grows to be as big as the number, then we go in the else, and we print that number. We never found something that divided into it evenly. We print the number, and this time, instead of the new line, which is the default action at the end of a print, it'll go to the new line for free, we're asking it not to do that. Instead, just put a space for us. That's so that when we get the next number, it'll appear on the same line. So, whenever you have a print, if you wish, you can add a comma and equals. And instead of getting the new line by default, which is what happened here, it went to the new line without us asking, it'll do whatever you ask it to do. And we ask it here just to make that space. In the end then, because the last print was that 97 space, then we want to do a print all by itself because that puts a new line. Okay, so the big thing, don't worry too much about the details or at all. Two things. One is that we will go through it more carefully. And the other is that we really don't care about algorithms in this class. We're learning Python. That is all. Let's look at running it. If I call primes.py at my command line prompt, I might have to put in where it's located, like dot slash. And then it runs. There it is. I can invoke the interpreter if I say Python 3 primes.py. I don't need that first line that specifies Python 3. And there it runs. But a, a very good thing about Python is introspection. And here's our first glimpse of introspection. If I specify Python 3 and I add a dash i for introspection and then say primes.py, it runs. But then immediately comes to me three greater than symbols. That's the interpreter's prompt. And it's saying to me, what would you like to do? And it will obey me when I ask it for anything that it should know because of the program that just ran. It'll tell me. For example, here we have number. And it reports to me the 99 comes back for anything else it might like, but nothing is in scope, so number is all we get here. But I could try out a function call that I just wrote, or a class. Okay, most students have an in integrated environment they want to use at their shop uses, perhaps, or that they use for another language, and you're just so welcome to do whatever you like there. I might not be able to help you. What I recommend to people who don't have a clue what to do is that they use idle. Idle comes for free with the interpreter and it's a no-brainer to use it. If you're on Windows, you're going to bring up that start button and type IDLE, idle. And you should get your idle. You might have to say idle 3, depending. But give idle a try and make sure that the Python that comes up is a 3. And you want it to be 3, 6 or more recent to get everything we're teaching here. So this window will come up and it will end right there. Then you can click that file button and it's like any editor. I'm going to get a file new and it brings me this. Then I type in my module and I want to run that module. When 
the cursor has its attention in this module, then this menu up here has a Run button. I click on that and I see at the bottom is Run Module. So if you click on that Run Module choice, then this module will run in the original interpreter's window. If I haven't saved this file before I hit that run, it'll force me to save it. And that's your process under idle. Nothing to it. Here's a nice link that tells you about a lot of integrated development environments. I know a lot of people really like PyCharm. And yes, it's great, especially for collaborative work. I use Emacs because I've used it forever and it is wonderful. People who use Emacs never go back. But whatever you like to use, I'm just real glad you got some. Alrighty, we'll look a little harder at the details. Remember that we saw the triple quote string. Well, maybe it's silly this time because it doesn't have any new lines or quotes within it. But it's a habit for my doc string, mostly. Here we see some other quoting facilities. You can use a single tick. And sometimes you might want to, so that you could embed the regular quote. But that's the old fashioned way, really. In a regular quote, you could embed the single tick, just like any other language. However, when you use triple quotes, whether they be triple regular quotes or triple ticks, then you have a really wonderful facility because you can embed new lines and anything you want, quotes. And I get to print all that out where I type it in exactly like it looks where out when it comes out. And how I have typed it in is exactly English. There's no backslashes in it. And that's what you're going for with Python. You want your code to look like English and you want to avoid any strange characters like backslashes. Four ways to delimit strings. Okay, you're on for your first exercises. Have a good time. I'll see you when you're done.